Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining us on this continued learning. Um, this evening, we're going to do a share that I guess, again, we wouldn't have done had it not been for the, um, you know, lock in the shul closure. And it's a share I'm quite excited to give because it's a share I'm calling highlights of the Haggadah. This isn't anything too in depth, but hopefully we'll share with everyone short ideas that can be used on Seder night and which I often share on Seder night and have been meaningful to me and gleaned from the Haggadahs I've liked to use, try each year to get a new Haggadah. I don't know whether that's going to happen this year, but for the past years I've got a new Haggadah, tried to learn through a new Haggadah, to have new ideas, a new take, freshness to the Seder. I would recommend a few uh, before we start. A lot of this is gleaned um, again, I said about four or five various Haggadahs I've got, but for two very good ones in English, I would recommend Erica Brown's Seder Talk. I found this to be a really, really great Haggadah with a lovely commentary at the bottom and essays at the back. And obviously Rabbi Sachs's Haggadah, what was the Chief Rabbi's Haggadah, and they've reprinted it many, many times. It really is, like much of his work, phenomenal. A lot of good essays in the back, but even the commentary on the bottom has a lot of good ideas. We're going to also show a lot from... Rav Osher Weiss's Haggadah, the Minchas Osher, and I've got the one in Hebrew, but I think they've translated it. Might not have quite as much as the Hebrew version, but again, a Haggadah with very shareable ideas, very powerful ideas, a range of different type of ideas, nothing too heavy. So again, something I would, I would recommend. So I'm going to screen share with you the Haggadah so we can have the text of Haggadah in front of us. And as I said, it's going to be short, snappy ideas. Um, which I hope, hopefully, these are ideas that will enhance your Seder and even maybe able for you to share at your Seder. Are people seeing, are people seeing that? Um, let me try it again. We just try to screen share yeah, that once good. again. That's good. On Safari. Feels good? Okay. It's good. People have got good. it? Okay, yeah. very good. All right. So we start with Kadesh. We start where the Seder begins with Kiddush. We've got 15 stages to the Haggadah, and the first one is Kaddish. And the truth is, we start every Shabbos and Yom Tov meal with Kiddush. So firstly, why should Kiddush be part of the Seder order, one of the 15 stages of the Seder night? And furthermore, it's considered one of the four cups of wine, which are the basis, which are sort of the pillars, or one of the pillars around which the Seder night is built are these four cups of wine. And the first cup is what we have to have any Shabbos and Yonta, but nonetheless, it is one of the four cups, one of the four pillars around which the Seder is built. And the truth is, it's not just Kiddush. Kiddush on Seder night has a different level. It's unique to Seder night, and it's an important part of Seder night. Because what we do at Kiddush, we literally, we sanctify the day. Kedushas Hazman, we make this declaration and we say, as you can see in the Kasa, Shabbat Chabon Mikolam, and we conclude it with Baruch Ata Hashem, Makadesh Yisav Hazmanim, blessed are you, the Lord, who sanctifies the Jews and their festivals and time, meaning we as Jews are actually the ones to sanctify, to sanctify the time. And the ability to sanctify time, to set aside time and to dedicate time to a certain purpose to a certain festivity is unique to what it is to be free. When we're celebrating on Seder night our freedom, when we discussed this a few nights ago in our share on Pesach and on what it means to be a slave, to be a free person is that ability to use your own time, to choose how you use time, not just to use time, but even to sanctify time, to raise time up for a higher purpose. And the Rambam, he has a slightly different text to his Haggadah. The end of his laws of Chomitz and Matzah, his laws on Pesach, he has the text of the Haggadah, pretty much the same as we have, but he has an extra line before Magid, before Holach Ma'anya, which is the opening paragraph that we have for Magid. He has the line, that the Jews went out in haste. For the Ramam, it's important to add how the time frame, the method, the speediness with which we left Egypt, because clearly, time and sort of the quick passing of time and the speediness of the redemption is an important part of what Seder night is about. Really that's 
something more than just sanctifying, time what the Rambam is alluding to, which has been elaborated on by others, is that the fact that the Yitzhiyas Mitzvah and the Exodus from Egypt happened in such haste, as we see from the matzah, we eat the matzah, as we'll see in the Haggadah, because there wasn't time for the bread to rise. There wasn't time, what should have become full-blown chomets bread, it was baked so quickly, because some, for some reason, the Exodus had to be in such haste, alluded to the fact that as Jews, perhaps we were beyond time. We were born in a time out of time. And again, that's the significance, the significance of Kiddush sanctifying that unique time. Furthermore, the four cups of wine, which Kiddush is the first, correspond, we famously know, correspond to the four expressions of redemption. That's how we usually understand it. That's how you, we usually quote it. That there's four expressions of redemption at the beginning of Pashas Va'era, in chapter six in Shamos. What do we say? God says, I will take you out from under the pressures of the oppression of Egypt. And I will save you from amongst them. And I will redeem you. And finally, and I will take you for me as a people. We usually say there's four different synonyms, four expressions of redemption corresponding to the four cups of wine. But the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Yerushalmi Talmud actually has it slightly different. Its wording is not as Dalit Lashona Shal Go'ula, that there's four expressions of redemption, but rather that Dalit Go'ulos. We have four cups of wine corresponding to the four distinct and unique redemptions. In other words, it wasn't one big redemption that the Torah expresses in four different ways. But what the Torah is saying and telling us by using these four different expressions is it's alluding to the fact that the redemption occurred in stages. And each stage of redemption warrants a celebration. It warrants us to raise a cup of wine and thank God and recognize God over that redemption. It may have not been the complete redemption, and possibly we still don't have the complete redemption. Hence, that fifth cup of wine, which we pour for Eliyahu and we don't drink it. The Vehevesi, the coming to the land of Israel, that fifth expression in the verse there, that we've yet to um, experience the ultimate redemption. Because redemption, unlike everything in life, doesn't necessarily come all at once. It comes in stages. And, if, and more poignantly, more poignantly, the stages actually correspond to the different holy days in the Jewish calendar. Because what is Vahosesi as Chemitacha Sivlos Mitzrayim? I will take you out from the pressures, from the burdens of Egypt. So the Medrash actually tells us that Moshe managed to negotiate that the Jews would have Shabbos off. Even before he actually brought the plagues and redeemed the people, he already managed to lighten the burden that they would have Shabbos off work. And the Medrash describes they would read text that they had, Megillos, perhaps that's what Eov was for, or other texts they had. So the ready, the first stage of redemption wasn't complete redemption. They had to work six days a week, but at least they had one day off the work. Then the Gemara tells us in Rosh Hashanah that on Rosh Hashanah, before the Pesach of the Exodus, six months before we actually left Egypt, in the midst of the plagues, when the plagues became really intense and heavy, already then the servitude ended. There's another stage of redemption. We were there in Egypt, but we're no longer slaves to Paro. Then on Pesach, on Seder night, we actually left Egypt. We gained our emancipation, we were free, we were out of the land of our enemy. And finally, the fourth expression or the fourth stage of redemption was Shavuos, was when we came to the foot of Mount Sinai and we received the, the Torah and we became God's people. So the four cups of wine, each one, each stage of the Seder is a different stage of redemption even if you think about it, we begin and we sanctify time. It's like Shabbos. We, like we make Kiddush every Shabbos. By the end of the Haggadah, we've talked about the Ten Plagues. We've talked about what went on in Egypt. We've already had a stage where we, we're celebrating when we are uh, raising a glass of the fact that the Shibbat is over. After the meal is like the meal they had on Seder night in Egypt itself, where they ate the matzah on Seder night and the morrow on Seder night itself. That's the third cup after the meal. And finally, the fourth cup after Halal is when we're raised up to the highest spiritual planes when we become God's people. Moving on, next stage in the Seder is Urchatz, where we wash our hands. So often in, um, in Judaism, we have a concept of su meirav First, one has to remove themselves from the wrongdoing, remove ourselves from evil, and then we can engage in good. 
first we have to wash our hands. We don't do this, but many have the minag that on the Shabbos, before they make Kiddush, they actually wash their hands for Hamotzi. Washing their hands, symbolizing washing the sin, washing the dirt away, and then Kiddush. Then we engage in sanctification. It says Rav Asher Weiss, on Seder night it's reversed. First we do Kiddush. We're able to jump straight into the holiness, and then only then afterwards are we commanded to we have the stage of Urchat, washing ourselves, ridding ourselves of that tumor, of that impurity. That's perhaps what Pesach is all about. Pesach meaning God passed over. It's from expression of leaping. And he says perhaps why it is Pesach, God leaped over, uh, God leaped over the, the, the doorways, the openings, the doors, the Pesach of the Jews' homes. In an allegorical way, he says, perhaps it's a reference to what we say, God says, open for me an opening of a, the, the top of a pin, the opening of a needle, and I will open for you the opening of a grand hall. Meaning God says in life, you have to take the first step. You have to do something small, and then leave it to me, I'll take it from there. Perhaps on Pesach, God is even willing to forego, to pass over that little opening. He leapt over, leapt, over the, leapt over the openings of the houses of the Jews in Egypt, meaning he even let us on that night forego that our need, our requirement to do our little bit. He did everything for us. We can jump straight into Kiddush, into Kaddish, into the sanctification, into the positive, and only then do we have to come back to the Urchat, the reverse order of usual. Karapas. So karapas is where we do the first dipping of the first two dippings of the night. We take the vegetables and we dip it into salt water. And Rabbi Saxon in his Haggadah has really, for me, one of the most beautiful ideas um, on this. As I mentioned, there's two dippings in the Seder, and the Manishtana alludes to that. We have the dipping of karapas, of dipping of the vegetable into the salt water. And then later on, we have the dipping of the maror into the charoses. And he says these two dippings correspond to two dippings that really bookend the story of Mitzrayim, of the Pesach say the night story. It all begins when, with the sale of Yosef, of Joseph's sale down to Egypt when he was sold by his brothers. That's what triggered it all off. Had Joseph not gone down to Egypt, Jacob and his family would have never followed. There would have never been the exile to Egypt. So that's when we dip the first dipping. Karpas corresponding to the dipping of Joseph's coat into the goat's blood that triggered at the begins, begins the entire process um, to start with. And what's the other end? On the night of the redemption, on Seder night, all those thousands of years ago in Egypt, the Jews take the hyssop and they dip it in the blood of their paschal lamb. And they put that, dab, they dab that blood on the lintel on the doorposts and that demarks it as a Jewish home. So again, these two dippings on the Seder night, the beginning and the end, correspond to the two dippings that bookend, that start and end the actual story in the Torah, the actual story of the exile and the exodus. But there's something even more here. Rabbi Sachs says, if you think about it, karpas is the dipping of something sweet. You take a sweet vegetable, potato, or parsley, something tasty, and what do we do? We dip it in salt water, in something bitter. And Conversely, we take the mora, we take something which is bitter, and we dip it into the charosas, apple, wine, something which is sweet. So as Rabbi Sachs, the story begins when the brothers of Yosef take a harmonious family, an idyllic life, a shepherd in the, in the um, fields, in the countryside of the land of Canaan, and they take that freedom, they take something which is so sweet, and they... They make it bitter. They turn it into brother, brother, bro, brotherly enmity and they sell their brother into Egypt. And conversely, on Seder night, all those thousands of years, ago, of years ago in Egypt, when the Jewish people come together as a people, they become Am Yisrael, word Am, a people from the word Im, together. They, they, they stuck together, even though they were slaves, they created a sense of unity, of peoplehood, and they take even the most bitter thing. At that moment, you can take the most bitter thing, i.e., the bitter herbs representing the bitterness and the harshness of slavery and you can dip it into charosis and something sweet when we're together when we have that solidarity becomes a prelude to the freedom Yachat, the next stage in the seder is splitting the middle matzah into two we take the larger piece we put it away for the afikoman what is going on there so two beautiful ideas on this the first is from erica brown she says that the prop of the seder is the matzah it's actually lechem only 
called the bread of affliction, as we'll see, Holach Ma'anya. This is the bread of poor man's bread, the bread of affliction. The Gemara explains what does it mean, Anya, also from Bulad, Anya to respond, to, co- to, to talk about, meaning it's the prop, it's the bread which we tell the story over. She says, we take that prop, we take the central motif of the Seder, and even before we begin to tell the story, we break it to represent that we ourselves are broken. It represents the brokenness of us. As we sit down to say the night, and it's been true in so many centuries, maybe not so true in our own lifetime when we've enjoyed so much freedom, but perhaps again true this year when we're constrained and restricted, we're not enjoying the freedoms we usually have. And we say to God, we show to God, we are broken, just like this matter is broken. But nonetheless, with everything we've gone through and everything we're going through, we're still here to tell the story. Despite our brokenness, we're still here to tell the story. She quotes from Leonard Cohen's famous song in the anthem, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. We crack the matzah, we break the matzah. We're not complete, we're not perfect. But it's through that brokenness, it's through the crack in the matzah that the light can get in. We're still here, we're still telling the story. Another beautiful idea is that the breaking of the matzah represents that brokenness within us, meaning we are each contained within us this tension, which creates the brokenness, the tension between the Yetzirah Hatov, the good inclination, the good angels within us, and the Yetzirah Hara, a more base, uh, evil inclination, the demons within each of us. And the bigger part, the bigger part of the matzah is what's called put away for tzofen. So in Kabbalistic terminology, the matzpun, that which is hidden, is the soul, the good part of us within us, within, our, within, within ourselves. And on the other hand, it's Safoni, which is like the northern, which was always the enemy in Tanakh. You know, the enemy comes from the north. So the Safoni in Kabbalah is a, is a word, is a terminology used for the evil inclination, that which is pulling us down. And we break ourselves, we break the matzah representing the good part of us and the less good part of us. And we have the bad part of us here in front of us. We're all dealing with that the whole time. We're all having to struggle with us. And we hide the good part of us, like we, our souls are hidden. And the purpose and the uh, process of Sedanai is really a journey to get to Tzofen, to get to discovering and getting to find that other half, the good part of us, till we can eventually get to Echad Mi Yodea, to that declaration, Echad Ani Yodea, that we can be complete again, that we're able to serve God, a one unified, complete God, as unified, complete human beings. Let's move on to Magid. So it's interesting, the Ramah, who is a major halachic authority, the role of the co-author of the Shulchan Aras, the Code of Jewish Law, he quotes from Baali Tosus, from the Tosafists who lived in the early part of the medieval period, 11th, 12th, 13th century, from Tosus, the Rimi London. There was a Tosafist who lived in London, who writes, he used to say the Haggadah in his lingua franca, in English or in old English, because it's important the Haggadah is not just said, it's not davened, it's not just lamed, it's understood, because it's not just to say the story, but it's really to tell over the story of, of, of the exodus from Egypt. And it's done in a very specific way. But Soloveitchik explained that the way the Haggadah is set up, and really the core part of the Haggadah is, hopefully we'll get to sharing ideas and highlights from the second part of the Haggadah next week, is that when we take those four five, those four verses from the middle of uh, Sefer Devarim, from the beginning of Parshas Kisavo, the portion about the Bikurim, the synopsis of Jewish history that was recited when the farmer would bring his first fruits to Jerusalem, we specifically take those four verses and we expound on them, we interpret them. Says so Rosh because the telling over of the Exodus, Sipu Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, the exercise of Magid, is really a exercise of Talmud Torah. It's an engagement of classical Torah study learning. When we take a verse, when we take a Mishnah, and we expound on it, we interpret it, we work through it, we uncover more and more, lefts, uh, more, and more layers and depth of understanding and meaning in it. And that's why Higadita Levincha, Telling over the story, that's the myth of telling over the story to the next generation, is really the other side of the coin, is really a sister mitzvah to the mitzvah of Talmud Torah, of teaching, Mishinantum Levanecha, teaching Torah to your children. And the Rambam, interestingly, against other, in, in, in distinction to other um, 
commentaries that count the mitzvahs and have two mitzvahs, one to learn Torah and one to teach Torah, the Rambam only has one mitzvah. For him, they are they come together, they're intertwined. The mitzvah to learn Torah, it's actually first he presents as the mitzvah to teach Torah. But in order to teach Torah, you have to learn Torah. Because for Rambam, the whole enterprise of Torah is in order to give it over. And so it is with Sedanite. The whole purpose of Sedanite, the whole purpose of telling the story is in order to relate it. And we relate it in a way of Talmud Torah, of expounding and developing it and interpreting it. Palach Ma'anya. So we begin Mage with this interesting statement with this um, invitation. We say, This is the blood of, bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Egypt. Anyone who needs, come in and eat. We say, This year we're here. Next year we'll be in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves. Next year, free people. Rabbi Daniel Rowe, the chief executive of Aish UK, he brought out Haggadah last year. Actually, also get another Haggadah I would highly recommend. And he points out, which many others point out, is there is this contradiction in matzah. And matzah both represents the lachma anya, the poor man's bread, the bread of affliction, it, the bread that slaves eat. And on the other hand, matzah is the symbolism of the freedom, as I mentioned before. The fact that we didn't have enough time for the bread to rise when we left eating, we left with such haste. We left with so many miracles that we eat this special bread on Pesach to represent that. And he says, in a very beautiful way, that matzah represents both because matzah is the way that the generation, the, the people in Egypt on the very first Seder night connect with all future generations. And it's how we, for all future generations to come, thousands of years later, are connecting back to our ancestors, to our forefathers in, in that generation of Egypt. In Egypt, they hadn't left yet. They were eating their impoverished bread, but as free men. It was poor man's bread, but they were free people. And we are asked to join in that. We as free people, we're free already. And we've already had the miracle of the speediness of the Exodus. Nevertheless, we still talk about and we still highlight the fact of this poor man's bread, because we are sharing this solidarity. We are linking back to them. And we eat, fundamentally, we eat the matzah today, not because we're poor men, because we left in a hurry. And they ate matzah because they knew that future generations would be eating matzah for that, for that very reason. So in a way, we're crossing time. Those people in Egypt, those who are redeemed, eat matzah because of what will be in the future. And we eat matzah because of what happened in the past. Manishtana. For many, you know, the highlight of the Seder, the four questions. That's how we usually understand it, the four questions. So in Rav Shechter's Haggadah, another Haggadah that came out, I think it was again last year, a lot of it is from the teachings of his great master, his great Rebbe, his teacher, Rav Soloveitchik. So Rav Soloveitchik, based on the Rambam, Maimonides, Maimonides says, Manishtana isn't really four questions. And that's why for him, it's not that the child asks. Rambam doesn't have that the child should ask these questions like we do. Rambam says it's the leader of the Seder. It's the adults who should say this. And because for Rambam, Ma doesn't mean how or why, but rather it means Ma. Look how special this night. This doesn't have a question mark. Rather, it should be an exclamation mark. It's a statement of, look how special, look how different this night is than all other nights. It's unique. It is a declaration that Seder night is completely special. Seder night is indeed a unique night. The truth is, for Rambam, every time we say Kiddush, that's what we're doing. Because when we make Kiddush, we're not really sanctifying Shabbos or Yom Tov. definitely not Shabbos. Shabbos will be Shabbos, it will be holy, whether we make Kiddush or not. Rather for Rambam, Kiddush, and by extension, Havdalah, are really bookends, the beginning of Shabbos and the end of Shabbos, where we extol the virtue of Shabbos, where we speak about the greatness and the beauty and the majesty and how Shabbos is such a pleasure for us. And he says, by extension, the Zemiris on Shabbos, when we sing those songs around the Shabbos table, which again have a similar theme. A lot of them talk about the beauty of the rest of Shabbos and the institution of Shabbos and the spiritual depth and the spiritual meaning that is invested in Shabbos. It's really for him an extension of Kiddush. Yes, you make Kiddush, you make one declaration over wine extolling Shabbos, but why not do more of it during throughout the meal, sing these songs that continue that theme. So it is on Seder night for the Rambam, 
we have Kiddush, but Ma'an Ishtan is again extolling the virtue of Sedenai. So the Rosh that's perhaps what the songs of Nirtz are. Just as on Shabbos we have the Zemiros of Shabbos, the songs of Shabbos, to enhance that extolling of, 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 of Shabbos, so too we have the songs of Pesach, Nirtza, which are there to enhance the extolling of how different, how unique, how special, how memorable Sedenai is supposed to be for us. The Abar Banel, the famous you know, biblical commentator who was a high officer in the in the uh, in the monarchy in the you know in the um, to the monarch in Spain around the time of the expulsion, he points out that really these four questions all together, the first two and the last two, but even within some of them, the question is what is the question that the child is asking? That there's this duality, there's this tension, this is contradiction on Seder night. We have matzah, but then we have mara. So you celebrate the freedom the good part, but also somehow celebrating the bad part, the bitter part, the negative history. Even within those two, there's the duality. Matzah both represents the freedom, but also the poor man's bed. The mora is obviously the bitter herbs, but we have lettuce, and the Gemara tells us chasa is the Hebrew, is the Aramaic word for lettuce. Why chasa? Shechasa kodesh baruchu. There's a sense, there's an element of God's mercy. And so to the leaning and the dipping, it represents, each one represents both. So what is the child asking? The child is asking an obvious question. When he observes the Seder, like any child would ask when he sees his parents living a contradictory life, what is it that you stand for? What is tonight really about? Is it about celebrating the freedom? Or is it about taking us back to the slavery, to the negative experiences? And the, the answer is, it's both. Avadim we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. God took us out from there. If you want to really understand, if you really want to appreciate, if you want to really get to grips with what freedom is, what we have, you cannot understand it without what it was born out of, without appreciating and understanding the slavery. Perhaps even more than that, it's when you see them both together, if you want to fully appreciate the freedom we have, perhaps now we get able to look back and even appreciate the slavery, the bad times. It's when we have a fuller picture, it's when we can live with a dichotomy, it's when we can live with the tension, when we can recognize that God is God, is not dualism, God is both the God of good and evil, when we recognize that everything that happens is ultimately for the good, we can even look back at the bitter herbs and we can dip it in charosis and we can see that even the bitterness turns out, well, there was a value, there was something to be gleaned, there was something to be taken. We go through hard times, at the time it's hard to see, the light at the end of the tunnel, how we're going to grow from this, how we're going to gain from this, how this could be good, but taken in context, taken with this duality of the Avdus and the Cheiros, even the negative part, even the slavery of old is, 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 is seen in a, in a new light. Avadim Ayinu, we, we begin the answer, this declaration, Avadim Ayinu Lefarib Mitzrayim, we were slaves to Paro in Egypt. Vayotin Hashem Misham, and God took us out from there. So there's a famous Machlokas and the Gemara between Rav and Shmuel. The answer we give to the child, what is tonight all about? So one says, well, you begin by telling the story of the slavery and you end by telling the story of the Exodus. And the other says, no, the story has to be much larger than that. The narrative has to be, have a much bigger panoramic view. It begins with Chila Hayu Avdi 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 Mitzrayim. It goes, uh, uh, it begins actually with Avraham and Terach. The fact that we came from pagan worshippers. And where does it end? It doesn't end on Seder night when we leave Egypt. We have to go forward and we have to talk about Sinai. We became God's people and we received the Torah. There's two stories going on here. The physical story of a physical exile and exodus and a spiritual story of the beginning as pagans and ending up as monotheistic, ethical monotheists serving God. Rabbi Sachs has the story and it's a beauty and there's is is incredible that in the very same story on this being told over on Satan night, there's two levels and there's two tracks. There's a story we tell our children. Our children understand physical slavery and physical emancipation. They perhaps aren't sensitive to the meaning of spiritual freedom, of serving a higher purpose. But for ourselves, the story has to has to transcend the story, the geopolitical story of the exile and the exodus has to be about a much larger narrative, a much larger arc of history about the movement from paganism to, to monotheism. Furthermore, what do we say here? 
Avodim, okay, we missed that one. Then we say here, Afilu kulonu chachamim kulonu nevonim. Even if we were all wise men, even if we were all knowledgeable, old elders that we know the whole Torah, we still have to tell the story of Egypt. Rav Rosh Rice points out, because we have every night, when we say Shema, the mitzvah zechira sitziyas mitzrayim, remembering Egypt. That's a cognitive intellectual act. We remember what happened, that we left Egypt. But on Seder night, it's not just enough to know. On Seder night, the mitzvah is to feel, to experience. On Sipri Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, that's what has to be told as a story. Because stories are the things that engender emotion, that engender feeling. You know, you can read facts. But when something is dramatized, when you go to a theater production, or you read a really great novel, or you watch a program, and it pulls at your heartstrings, the way only a story can, we get invested into the characters, we place ourselves in it, we go through it with them, it moves us emotionally. And that's why even if we're all wise, we know the facts, we know the say the story, we know the, say, the story of the Exodus from Egypt, nonetheless, each and every year we have to go over it, because cognitive knowledge, intellectual knowledge can be stored, emotions aren't stored from one year, you know, you have knowledge, okay, you keep it. You don't necessarily hold on to an emotion. So Seder night is about engendering an emotion, and therefore, whoever you are, you have to go through this experience each and every year. You have to retell the story, because it's stories, after all, which are best at engendering the, sto- the, the emotion. Just a few more minutes, um, if you bear with me. We, got, we move on, if you look on the source and the screen share. We've got Maisa Barabi Eliezer Barabi Yoshua. So then we tell this story, we tell this episode, you know, and it, perhaps an example of these wise people, these great chachamim, these great sages, even they were telling the story of, of, of the exodus from Egypt. And we're told they were so busy, so engrossed in telling the story in Bnei Barak, that they were talking all night until it became the morning, until their, their students had to come. Giazman Kriya Shema Shacharis, the time of the telling over, the time of reciting the Shema Shacharis has arrived. There's a really beautiful story of Asher White has in his Haggadah, from, from Levi Yitzchak Mibaditchev. So the Kedushas Levi, famously known for his love of every Jew, even for the simple Jew, he tells the story that on Seder night after Shul, Rav Levi Yitzchak of Baditchev, the rabbi of the town, the Hasidic master of the town, before he went to his own Seder night, would go around to listen, to peep on, to, you know, you know stand outside the doors and windows of the Seders of his, the simple people in his town. And he gets to a seder, it's just, you know, he gets to one of the sadar, I mean, it hasn't been long, it's only been going, it's 20 minutes, half an hour. And he hears that one, the, um, the, they're reading the next paragraph, Baruch HaMok and Baruch Hu, and he hears that the person reading the story, the simple chosid, reads it as follows. He says, Keneged Arab Abonim Dibro Torah, the Torah speaks about four different children, Echad Chacham, one is a Chacham, Echad Rasha, one is a Rasha. So he wants, he's wondering why he's saying it in a weird way. Why echad? Why is he elongated? Why is he stretching out the word echad? And he realizes because there's a halacha when it comes to Kriya Shema. When it comes to saying Shema, we're supposed to elongate. When we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Melekinu Hashem, echad. And when we elongate the word echad, we're supposed to think about the fact that God has the meaning that God rules over all four corners of the world, up and down. So when we, when we, when we, Elongate the word, it gives us time to think about it. And Revelation Yitzchak Vedish lifts his eyes heavenward and he said, Look how beautiful, look how great, look how special these simple Jews are. The rabbis, these great sages, these five rabbis in Bnei Barak, the greatest Talmudic sages of the time, for them, they were working and telling the story over all night. And it wasn't until the dawn broke and it came in the morning that the students came along and says, now the time for Kriya Shamash HaSacharis. They had reached the level, and now was the time for them to be Mekabal O Malchus Shemaim, to make the statement of that declaration of our faith in God, Shema Yisrael Hashem Malakin Hashem Echad. But look at these simple, beautiful, pure Jews in Berdichev. They've only been going half an hour. They're only on the beginning of Magid, and they're already at Echad Chacham. They're already elongating the Echa, they already the Mekabel on Malchus Shemaim. They have already reached that level, which took these five, these great, these five great sages, um, a long time, a long time to do. We um, move on from the um, the great sages, and we have this interesting paragraph of Baruch Hamok and Baruch Hu. It's sort of like a blessing on the Torah. Baruch Shanos and Torah La'amo Yisrael. It's the very same words as we use in the blessings over Torah that we recite. Um, each and every morning. 
And Erica Brown writes very beautifully that this is the paragraph that links, that serves as a bridge between being told about the um, Seder night of these great sages to the four sons. She says, we make this blessing, this blessing of Torah, because it's this point is that transmission between, of the transmission of Torah between the great sages and between the four various different sons, even the most simple sons. And that transmission isn't an easy one. There's a beautiful imagery when God gives the luchos, the, the ten tablets, or the two tablets with the ten commandments to Moshe, the Medrash tells us that they were six tefachim, they were six handbreadth tall. And the Medrash says God held on to the top two, Moshe onto the bottom two, and there was the middle two which were left unguarded, unheld. And that's really a metaphor for the giving over of Torah in each and every generation. The teachers, the parents, we can hold on to the top, and the children are grasping from below. But there's a space in between that neither, neither of us can reach, and there's always a jeopardy. Will the education, will that which we're passing over really be passed over? Will they really go down to our children? Will they really take hold of it? Will they really continue what that which we're trying to hand over? So this is this Baruch HaMok, and this is this, this really a blessing, a beseechment to God. Yes, of course, we have great rabbis. We have a history. We have a tradition. We have a legacy of Sedanite of the Torah. The question is, will we be able to successfully pass that on to our children? Even children are not the Chacham, the children who are perhaps the Rasha, the Tom, and the She'en Yodea, She'en Yodea Lishov. And finally, on these four children, quite, quite, quite possibly they're not really four children. They're four stages in our own life. We go from She'en Yodea Lishov, the stage where we're not able to speak, we don't have the intellectual capacity, to Tom, but we're young, but we're simple. We have to have simple explanations. To the Rasha, perhaps that rebellious stage in life, when we've been told something, Tom, we've accepted it, accepted it, we've accepted it innocently and wholeheartedly, but now we're rebelling on it. We're questioning our, our premises. We're questioning that which we've received. And hopefully, as we age and we mature, we come to a stage of a chacham, where we go back and we recognize that which we were taught younger, the tradition we've been given, is actually a wise one, is a, is a good one, and we're able to, to mature into that stage of chacham, of of, of, of wisdom. It's interesting that the, these questions are based on the verses in the Torah, that the Torah tells us in three different places, there'll be a time when your child will ask you such and such and you'll answer. What's interesting is the wise, per, the wise son's question is from the book of Devarim. The other ones are from the, the end of the Pasha of Bo, the end of the portion dealing with the exodus from Egypt itself. The wise one is only 40 years later. The book of Devarim is Moshe's speech at the end of going out, at the end of the wilderness sojourn. Rabbi Sachs writes, sometimes the wisest question, true wisdom, real historical understanding, it takes time. The wise, man, the wise son's question can only be asked after that elapse of time. Finally, on the wise, uh, the wise, two more things. The wise man's question. He asked, what's He's asking about three things, testimony, statutes, and laws. And these really represent the three different areas of Torah, of halacha. You have edut, as well. Shamshon Fal Hash famously explains, Edus are all those mitzvahs which are testimony, meaning Shabbat and Chagim, when all those things that celebrate and mark and remind us about that relationship, the Edut, testifying about our unique relationship with God. The Chukim are the statutes, the laws which we don't understand. God says, do these mitzvahs, even if you don't understand them, observe them. And Mishpatim are you know, I guess, a civil law, the law that uh, lets a society run and function, don't steal. And if you steal, this is how much you have to pay back all those very things, various things. And what do we answer him? Meaning the, the mitzvahs have to have an impact. And how do the mitzvahs have an impact? It's these three stages. First, you have the edut. The edut is what's called the hachana, it's preparation, it's setting the scene, it's observing a Shabbos, it's having yontif, it's those mitzvahs that establish the relationship between us and God. Then you have the mishpatim, the laws are which are the sumira, don't do evil, don't harm, don't create a crooked society. And finally, it's the chukim, what the ultimate purpose are, to observe God's mitzvahs, the positive mitzvahs that we observe just because God commanded them to us and we build a relationship with with him through them. And finally, the Rosha is very interesting. Here we have in our Haggadah, but what does the Rosha ask? What is this service for you? And we answer him, it's you for not him, meaning he's not really asking a question, he's making an accusation. But in the Yushalmi, it has a slightly different terminology. 
In the Talmud Yerushalmi, it doesn't say Moha Avoda Hazos Lochem, but rather Moha Tircha Hazos Lochem. What is this bother for you? The Russia looks around and he sees how much work goes into Pesach, how it looks cumbersome, it looks difficult, it looks like there's a huge amount of effort that goes into it to make it happen. And his question is, what's all the bother for? You were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and now you're slaves to God, to another power. You're slaves to God with everything, all these mitzvahs he's given you. And with the terminology he uses, he doesn't understand it. But Abu says to him, what's our answer to him? You don't understand. They are qualitatively diff- completely different types of service, of servitude. A slavery to Pharaoh was a meaningless one. It made us not free. But the service to God, the whole purpose of the Exodus was to become servants of God. And when we subjugate ourselves and we fix ourselves in our service of God, that's really what true freedom. But Abu Zed, the whole purpose of the Exodus was in order to serve God with his mitzvahs. In Ben Churin, Elami, Shoisik, the Torah, true freedom really comes with our surrender and our commitment to Torah. Had he only understood that it's not a tircha, that it's not a bother, perhaps he wouldn't have been her, the Rasha. Perhaps his whole attitude on life is because his perspective, the way he sees, the way we do the mitzvahs, is it's a tircha. It's bothersome, it's cumbersome, and therefore he doesn't appreciate the beauty, the majesty, the depth, the freedom, the real freedom that is inherent in all, in all those mitzvahs that we're celebrating on Seder night and throughout our Jewish, our Jewish practice. So we'll stop here. We've got, I think, about just about halfway through the Seder. And please, God, next week, we will pick up again with another Haggadah highlight where we'll try to share some ideas on the second part of, 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 of the, uh, of the Haggadah. Thank yeah. you.